Days program. Congratulations, you've made it to the last day of the four-week program. So at the end of this video is going to be problem number 24. Now, if you're an incoming student to the Citadel, make sure that you've written down all of those solutions and bring them to campus so we can give you a reward when you get here for just reviewing stuff that hopefully we already knew. We're just applying it in an engineering context. So for our last lesson, technically, we're going to be talking about Kramer's rule, but we're not actually going to be using it. We're just going to pull out the main point of the rule and then use that as a guideline for solving any number of engineering problems. Now Kramer's rule is technically a matrix algebra process where you're going to create a matrix, sort of a square of numbers, in order to solve for some number of unknown variables in those equations. However, we're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of what matrix algebra is. That can be a whole class on its own when you get here. Instead, the main point of Kramer's rule that I want you to remember is for however many number of unknown variables you have, so if I have x unknown variables, that means that I need at least x number of equations to solve for those unknowns. Now you've actually been seeing my colleagues doing this over the past couple of days. If I have a scenario where I have 2x plus 3y equals 7, just throw out some numbers, the two unknowns that I have in this scenario are x and y. So I can't just magically solve this for x without doing something. I might produce a second equation that could be something like y equals, let's say it's 4. Now, since I have a second equation, equation 1 and equation 2, I could use substitution, plugging in my value of 4 for y, which leaves me only one variable, going back to uh, week four, lesson one, solving for one unknown in a single equation. Once I've substituted it in, it becomes the only unknown. Now, if I had something that instead was 2x plus 3y equals 7z, now I have three unknowns. So we're getting into what you were thinking about yesterday, where in order to solve this, I need to know more about the scenario. If I have one additional equation, I might have something like x plus y equals eh, 14. So now my x and y I could pick whatever method I want to use, but ultimately, I'm still going to end up with at least two variables there. So if I have a third equation, maybe z equals 2, now I have three equations, 1, 2, 3, with three unknowns. If I was solving this with Kramer's rule, I would make matrices, sort of blocks of data out of those with my values for my three x's, 2, 1, and 0, 3, 1, and again 0, and then uh, 7, 0, and 1 for z, put all of my coefficients, 14 to 2, off on the side, and solve. 
Now, again, we don't really care about the logistics of actually using Kramer's rule because we already know how to use elimination and substitution and root finding, all these fantastic tools we covered earlier in the week. So instead, we're just going to apply this. All right, one system that environmental engineers design is what we call a settling tank or a sedimentation basin. These are used in water and wastewater treatment uh, plants in order to allow contaminants generally that are denser than water to sink under the force of gravity. Now this is actually a reasonably energy efficient way to separate contaminants because I don't have to use a whole bunch of external energy sources, uh, pumps and cyclones and stirring mechanisms. It just uses gravity, which is sort of naturally occurring from the potential energy in those heavy particles. You'll learn more about what all is happening energy-wise in physics and other classes. We're just going to focus in on how can we apply algebra, the whole point of this REEFS program, in order to solve an actual engineering problem. Now, based on my years of experience in education, I can tell you that these are the equations we're going to need to use. And you might go, well, Dr. Lawton, how am I supposed to come up with that bank of equations? Well, once you've had your four years of engineering education, you'll create this database of engineering equations in your head or maybe just know where to reference them in something like your FE reference handbook or any of your textbooks in order to pull them out and then just create algebra problems, math problems, out of engineering problems. So in this case, the four equations that I know are relevant to this scenario, the first is our equation for our overflow velocity, which we call V sub O, and then we have our standard equation for detention time. Now, equations three and four here, I know based on the geometry of this settling tank. In this case, we're saying that our settling tank is a rectangular prism, a rectangular tank. So the volume of the tank is the height times the width times the length. And A sub S, or surface area, is just the area on the top, our width times our length. Now, based on the problem statement itself, we have two more equations that we have in our data bank. We know the detention time is given as four hours and the depth or the height of the tank is three meters. So I have six equations here to play with, and I'll give you a heads up. We're going to use all of them, but we would have to think through what we need. So if I didn't have this bank sitting over on the side and I was just looking at this problem, I would probably go, well, overflow velocity, I know that overflow velocity is calculated by my flow rate divided by my surface area. Now here I go, hey, I have three unknowns. So I'm going to need at least two more equations, or a total of three equations, in order to potentially solve this problem. That's the whole idea with Kramer's rule. So I might say, well, I want to substitute in something for Q, and I want to substitute in something for A sub S. So that would give me three equations. Looking over at my bank of equations, I can rearrange equation number two, which would tell me that Q is actually my volume divided by T, my detention time. And we can look at equation four, which is our equation for surface area. So I'll take equation one and substitute in the rearranged equation two and then I have equation four that I can substitute in for my surface area term. So we're moving along. We went from one equation with three unknowns, plugged in two more equations, so we had a system of three by three, and now I've rearranged it, and I've got more stuff in here. I have more variables. Now, what's kind of good is that if I think about substituting things in, in terms of values I don't know yet. If I look down at equation 5, 
variable t, I already have a value for. So we're okay there. But I still have some more unknowns. Now, this is where a little bit more experience comes in. I can look at this and go, hey, volume, that is my equation 3. So I'm going to substitute that in. Volume from equation 3 is my height times my width times my length. Oops. And divide that by what was already in my denominator. The time that I know, the width that I know, the length. Hey, kind of convenient. I've got matching terms in the numerator and the denominator. And if we think all the way back to week one, if I divide a number by itself, it's just one. So my width and my width cancel out. My length and my length cancel out. So I can reduce this all the way down to my overflow velocity is my tank height divided by my detention time. One equation, three unknowns, but these two equations, equation five and six, plug right in. So, three equations, three unknowns, two of them technically aren't really unknown, so that leaves one for me to solve for. When I plug in my values, switch colors just for consistency's sake, I have three meters divided by four hours. Now the standard way that we represent an overflow velocity is either in feet per day or meters per day. So I'm gonna do a quick little unit conversion going way back to week two. The number of hours that I have in every day, 24. So this allows me, once again, to cancel some stuff out. My units of hours and hours disappear, leaving me my meters per day. So in the end, when I plug all this through, right up here, my final overflow velocity, 3 times 24 divided by 4, ends up being 18 meters per day as my final answer. So we actually ended up applying Kramer's rule a couple of times in solving this problem. Even though we weren't trying to create a matrix, sort of the strict definition of what Kramer's rule is, when we had an equation and unknowns in it, unknown variables, we always were thinking through, how many more equations do I need in order to get rid of unknowns and reduce it down to one unknown that I can solve for. Now you'll notice when I solved through this problem, I kept everything until the very end as variables. This makes oftentimes the math a lot easier since we're just dealing with letters and things are canceling out. Sometimes you might be tempted to plug in numbers right away. I would caution you against doing that too often because if I calculate something in one equation and then plug that calculated number into another and then another calculated number into another, any rounding error that you have in that first equation you solve for is just going to get worse and worse and worse as you keep calculating with that rounded number. So be careful not to plug in numbers too early. In this case, it would have been impossible to plug them in too early, so you had to solve it as an algebra problem. All right, this is the last day of the four-week REAPS program. Homework 24 is going to show up soon. Good luck.